Good afternoon, Mr. Bateman. I'm sorry you've been kept waiting. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, Sir Brian. Uh, and you can see me, or at least most of yes. me, given this. Um, now, you're, you're talking to a, a room which has uh, eight people in it. Um, it's a very large room. We're all properly socially distanced. Uh, and all except uh, Miss Scott, who will be asking you the questions, are wearing masks. Um, for ease of hearing, I may remove mine from time to time. You're talking really, though, not to us, but to people who are elsewhere watching remotely, um, for obvious reasons. There are about 200 of them, uh, and they're waiting to hear what you have to say. I'm sorry, as I say, that you've been kept waiting. Now, you're at home, are you? I'm in, in my office, uh, which is um, in, in my home. Right. Uh, and is there anyone else uh, around? Uh, my wife is in, in the, the main house, uh, not in the office. I'm on my own in this office. Right. Well, Mary will now uh, ask you to take the, the oath. Please state your full name. Neil Martin Bateman. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly and sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, Miss Scott. Mr Bateman, you were an independent benefits advisor to the McFarlane Trust um, and its registrants between 2008 and its closure, is that right? Yes, I have actually checked my records and the first case did actually come in in, in uh, 2007. Uh, and you, oh, sorry, and you also provided independent benefits advice to Caxton Foundation registrants between de December 2011 and its closure. Is that also correct? That is that is correct. And you are currently um, providing independent benefits advice to some um, registrants of the English Infected Blood Support Scheme. Is that right? That that is correct. I've also um, provided welfare rights help and advice to three people registered with the Scottish Infected Blood Support Scheme. That's quite recent. Now, you've provided two witness statements for the inquiry and you wanted to make some amendments to those statements, as I understand. Is that right? Yes, if I may. So, in the first witness statement, um, and I'll just bring this one up, um, it's WITN 3487001. And if you go to page six of that document, please, Shumik. Uh, you, you're asked there, you're, you're talking there about experience of government decision making. And you talk in paragraph 29 about the DWP carrying out a, a review of cases of people with haemophilia who were refused PIP. And I'll ask you questions about that in due course. And you say this demonstrated there were many poor quality assessments of the impact of haemophilia on people's functional ability. And if we can go over the page, um, uh, and you give reasons why that is, and um, I'll ask you to, to speak to that in due course. Private assessment companies requiring, required by the DWP, were, uh, and then uh, the DWP um, requ were required, required the private assessment companies to provide new guidance to their staff. Paragraph 32, you say, um, uh, you talk about the impact on people with haemophilia and um, um, hepatitis C. And then it's at paragraph 33 that you want to make the amendment. You say, the comparatively rare nature of the conditions which infected blood victims have made it harder for staff working on assessments who are overwhelmingly not doctors. 
This was revealed to the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee by senior staff in the assessment companies who carry out, and you've written the word, accurate assessments of functional ability. Do you want to change that? It, it, yes, please. It's, it's really probably a typing error. Um, it just makes it clearer if we just remove the word accurate. I don't think it, uh, it you know, it's a, to say I think it's a typing error. And then in your second statement, I won't take this up, you, you are, are, are talking, you, you are giving evidence in paragraph 22 of that uh, about a recollection um, you have of Martin Harvey asking you to submit monthly case reports. Uh, and you give the date there as October 2011. Um, I believe you want to change that, do you? Yes, the reports actually started in November 2011. Um, I think you must have asked me in October. Thank you. Um, before I um, ask you um, questions about uh, 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 about uh, the advice that you've given and so on to registrants, I'm just going to run through with you your background and qualifications. So is it right that you're a qualified social worker? I am. And that you have a law degree and hold two postgraduate diplomas in social policy and social work? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, and that between 1982 and 2003, you worked as a social worker and in welfare rights for a range of local authorities, health authorities, and for the DWP, Department of Work and Pensions. I was seconded in 2000 for six months to the Department for Work and Pensions to provide policy advice on pension of poverty. But your summary is otherwise correct, yes. And in 2003, you became a freelance welfare rights advisor. Yes. And your work um, in that role includes advising on welfare rights, representing claimants at all levels of, lo of, of, the, of social security um, appellate systems, including the first tier tribunal and upper tribunal hearings. Yes. You deliver training in welfare rights. Uh, and, yes. and you advise on policy and write on the subject, including having authored or contributed to 16 books. That is correct, yes. Um, and in addition to that, you're a member of the Expert Witness Institute and have undertaken work as an expert witness in both civil and criminal matters. That is correct. Can you tell us how you first came um, across the McFarlane Trust? Um, I, I had a phone call one day and I have now pinpointed it as 2007, from a, a man who, he phoned me up and he said he was in difficulty with his benefits. Um, he said that he was um, registered with the McFarland Trust and that he had spoken to Martin Harvey, the chief executive, and they were willing to pay me to sort out his benefit problem that he had. He said he'd... he'd um, had some input by the Terence Higgins Trust, and he actually also, I remember he said he'd been to a firm of solicitors to try to get the problem solved. Um, and basically, he had moved house, and unfortunately at the same time, um, had found himself in a hospital, and all his benefits had stopped. Um, and um, so uh, I did contact Martin Harvey just to confirm the arrangements and um, and then I took on the case effectively. Um, it wasn't straightforward but there were a whole series of administrative failures by the DWP um, one of which if I remember correctly went back um, some years and then there was a further problem that sprung out of that which was a problem with his council tax benefit um, and, uh, you know, it did take um, some correspondence and uh, also a formal complaint to the DWP uh, to get them to resolve it and to reinstate his benefits at the correct rate. Um, so that was the first case. I'm not entirely sure how he heard of me. I think it may have been. He found me on found my website, but I'm not sure. So do, do you understand that, that the... Uh, benefit support that was available at that stage to beneficiaries was uh, of the McFarland Trust was through the Terence Higgins Trust. 
Uh, that's what I was told by Martin Harvey, but I don't know the detail of it. I think you, you suggested in your witness statements that it was a, it was a light touch process, a light touch um, benefit support that they were being offered. Is that right? Well, again, that's what I was told. Um, and uh, after that case, um, you became uh, you began to work more frequently, did you, for registrants at the McFarlane Trust? Yes. Um, word got out, and um, people started seeking my help um, with various benefit problems. And of course, this was before the uh, the impact of the the changes to benefits for people with long-term conditions that was brought about by employment and support allowance. Um, and uh, so it was sort of wasn't a, wasn't a huge amount of, of work, but there were, you know, it was a regular um, requests coming in um, for me to sort out people's various benefit problems. I remember there, were, there was a very tricky overpayment case, um, which someone had got themselves into difficulty with. Um, there were various sort of, um, uh, issues to do with undeclared capital. I remember actually also there was a very, very sad situation um, which I did manage to resolve of a, a man who was a registrant with severe haemophilia and HIV who um, used to enjoy a game of golf with his father um, once or twice a week and the Department for Work and Pensions put him under surveillance. And, um, and stopped his benefits and mounted a prosecution and I successfully challenged the stoppage of his benefits, albeit I didn't quite get it back at the, the rate being paid before, but obviously the um, prosecution didn't proceed. But that took quite a lot of, of time and effort. Um, it's quite a harrowing case actually, and I dealt with him subsequently on various, various issues that he had. And I'll certainly come on and to ask you some questions about the issue of undeclared uh, payments from the um, McFarland Trust and other trusts and schemes. Um, Sorry, can I just may I just clarify that that particular case wasn't alleged undeclared capital or income from the trust. Mm -hmm. It was uh, he was alleged to have uh, not reported an improvement in his condition <coughs> for disability living allowance purposes. And given that these are deteriorating conditions, you can see straight away there's a problem. Yes. Um, what did you know um, in 2007, 2008 about um, people with haemophilia being infected with HIV through their treatment? Well, obviously, I was aware from media coverage, um, you know, the terrible tragedy. Uh, when I spoke to Martin Harvey, I can remember him telling me what the... What the uh, what the McFarland Trust did, and I can remember him giving me the awful figure. Um, I remember the, the guy I spoke to who first, if you like, first instructed me. Um, he was telling me about the numbers involved in the background. He told me about the, the settlement that people in Ireland had. Um, I remember being really, really shocked, um, particularly um, by the circumstance of the first man because he not only had HIV, but he, he had hepatitis C, and he was also on the new variant Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease um, list as having contracted that. And on top, that was on top of having severe haemophilia with really, you know, very badly damaged haemarthropathy, the type of aggressive osteoarthritis that people with haemophilia get in their joints. Um, I had done some work with people with haemophilia when I had been a social worker, albeit not very much. Um, I was also um, aware, well, more than aware actually, um, quite familiar with the benefit rules as they applied to people with HIV and, and how ben the, the benefit entitlements had sort of gradually over time uh, changed um, as treatments had improved. Uh, we can see in some of the documents that you've written, and we'll, we'll come to some of those in due course, that you now know quite a lot about 
how haemophilia impacts on people and, and HIV and so on. How, how did you go about um, educating yourself uh, about the issues faced by the McFarlane Trust registrants? Uh, well, I spoke to Martin Harvey um, on more than one occasion, actually, um, to get background. Uh, I looked at their website. Um, I, uh, I did actually read up about HIV, haemophilia, and haemarthropathy. I had a look on the web, um, and uh, I uh, have some have a, med have a med basic medical um, textbook, which I uh, um, often use just to check things. Um, I wasn't really very aware of um, how the uh, the payment system worked at all. Um, when you when you do you refer in there to the McFarlane Trust payment system? Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah. So is this right that when you were working for um, the McFarlane Trust, and it, this may also apply to to, to the Caxton Foundation, um, that there were two routes for um, uh, registrants to um, uh, get help from you. The first was a referral by the McFarlane Trust or by the Caxton Foundation to you. Um, and the second was a request for the beneficiary themselves to work with you that they would make to the McFarlane Trust or the Caxton Foundation. Is, it, is that right? Well, it was a bit of a mixture. The um, people quite often came to me direct and said, oh, I've got this problem you know, with my benefits. Please, can you help me? Or, and I, I would always say, because obviously McFarlane were funding the work, well, I say McFarlane, McFarlane and Caxton were funding the work. Um, and also because I thought it really important that they were aware of people's needs and the kind of benefit problems and challenges that the folk were facing. I'd always ask them just to contact um, the, the trusts and the charities um, it, and to get a referral to me. Uh, and that way it was all kind of sort of, if you like, sort of set up properly. Um, um, but um, I was certain, I, you know, over the years I've received, you know, very, very many um, requests for help from people to sort out the sort of problems they have with their benefits. So when the, 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 the charities were referring people to you, um, do you know how, how, what criteria they applied um, in making that decision for referral? As far as I'm aware, it was just it's, it's, if someone asked. I'm not aware there was any filtering out. So as far as you were aware, if someone asked that they could be referred to you, there was n you were not aware of, of circumstances where people asked to be referred to you and that was refused? I am... I, I would be really actually shocked if that was the case. I'm, I'm completely unaware that people were uh, told, no, we don't think you need Neil's, Neil Bateman's help. Uh, and uh, were you aware that some people were required to um, meet with you and, and, and get advice from you and, and indeed follow your advice? Well, as I said in my witness statement, it's, it's very common practice amongst grant-making charities uh, for them to require people to maximise their benefits. And, you know, there, there are good reasons for that, um, because obviously it, it provides potentially a more sustainable income and, and also gives them a right of appeal to an independent tribunal if, 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 if they're unhappy. Um, so I, I have looked back over my records. It's taken me a very, very long time since I wrote my witness statement. And I think that there are about five, between five and 10% of uh, the people that I dealt with uh, were, if you like, required to, to have a referral to me. That it was, that they, it was said that, please, can you get Neil to check your benefits? Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really aware of, of um, objections that, that folk made other than on, you know, one or two occasions. So, so in the main, if the, if the um, 
referral came came in that way it, it's your experience is it that it it didn't make very much difference to how you mean if the people to, were asked to, yes. asked to have a referral it, did, to it me. didn't it didn't make much difference in terms of, of how receptive they were to working with you no and taking most, your advice. most people were, were very happy um, because very often I would pick up something some under claiming um, also you know quite often there would be um, quite complex benefit problems with people's benefits having been stopped or you know all sorts of things um, and uh, also quite a lot of quite a lot of people as I recall um, whose circumstances have changed you know they maybe had hepatitis C for some time um, but the symptoms um, from the liver disease were uh, such that they could you know say carry on their lives they, they were continuing working for example and then things have got to the stage where they needed either to have treatment or um, the, the, the symptoms were coming worse uh, at which point um, you know they, they would need some some advice about their benefit entitlement because um, obviously our other income had stopped. Do, do you know anything about what registrants were or, or what or how registrants were told about your service? Do, do you know how do you know how it was publicized to registrants? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? Do you know how it was publicized to, to registrants by the by the trusts, by the Parliament Trust, by the Caxton Foundation? Well, my my services. Yeah. All right, all right. Um there was information on their website, uh quite quite good information. Um there was certainly a very active grapevine, because um, I used to get a lot of people, I still do even now, uh, who say, oh, I've heard you're really good at sorting out benefit problems, and I've got this problem. Um, also, at some point, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know when, the Haemophilia Society started telling people um, that if they had uh, infected uh, blood, um, at uh, if they'd had infected blood and, and they had haemophilia, that uh, they should come to me to sort out their benefit problems. Um, I know that was done verbally on recommendation, as well as being on the Haemophilia Society website and in a leaflet that they have published. So, for w when a uh, beneficiary, when a registrant either came to you through referral from the McFarlane or came to you directly, and then you Rooted them back to the McFarland Trust or the Caxton Foundation. Is this right that you would be provided with details of that registrant um, by the relevant charity and an outline of the problem um, that they were having and details so that you could contact contact them directly in order to progress the. I'm, I'm really not a believer in bureaucracy, having spent most of my career challenging bureaucracy. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to have, you know, I said to them, we really need to have as simple a system as possible. And so when they uh, would send me a referral by email, it was really just a sentence or two, um, and plus name, address, phone numbers. Um, and, um, you know, it would say this, this person's a primary beneficiary and that their um, employment and support allowance has been stopped. For example, you know, it was really that that um, that, that simple. Um, I wouldn't really be wanting to have. I mean, the other problem is if you get lots of information. Or I've been here before with other organisations. If you get lots of information, you know, and only a little bit of it is actually really relevant to what you need to do. So it's sort of a bit of a waste of everyone's time, as well as obviously potentially, you know, just being. A, um, and, then, yeah. uh, and then with. Uh McFarlane Trust, um, you were a con contractor and you would carry out the work, submit a bill, and then they would pay it. Is that how it worked with McFarlane Trust? Well, my, my company was a contractor. Yeah. Uh, and was that and, the same? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I would, every month, well, uh, uh, initially, because the cases were sort of somewhat ad hoc, I, I would inv invoice them once I'd finished work on the cases. Um, I can't remember at what point I started, uh, it was when the work started really to build up um, that I, I uh, started invoicing them monthly. Um, so there'd be an invoice showing the total time and together with a, 
a breakdown of the time spent on each case. And I'll just look at look at a breakdown in a moment. But was was that broadly the the arrangements for the Caxton Foundation as well? Yeah, yeah, it was. So if we look then at, at one of your reports back uh, of work done, can we have please, um, uh, Shomik, W I T N two three eight seven zero zero seven. WITN two ah oh, sorry WITN three four eight seven zero zero seven So this in um, your witness statement you say is a a, a feedback from a, a, a month that you chose randomly, is that right? That's right. So I've just did out of the of the file. Uh, um, and and you can see, uh, the the invoice and time um, sheet was was emailed. Um, I'm trying to think separately. Um, Uh, and um, what this looks like is—is is this right? Where where the black marks are would be um, different registrants' names, and then a sentence or two on, on what, what what work you've carried out. Um, yeah. So originally, I'd use the um, as they called it the registrant number, um, uh, but then that was getting a bit confusing after after a while. And um, particularly if I look back, I could I could you know I just couldn't work out who it was. Um, so I started using names. So yeah, the, the names were there. Uh, and was the d was it a similar arrangement for the Caxton Foundation? Yeah, it was the same. As you can see, it's really you know um, thumbnail, um, very 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 brief. These these are really what I would call activity reports uh, rather than outcome reports. Um, and of course, people were telling me you know people have told me a lot a lot a lot a lot of stuff about their lives. And I didn't put those in the reports. I wouldn't. Um, very, very personal stuff they were telling me. Then moving on to your work with the Caxton Foundation, which um, started in December 2011. Again, how, how did that come about? Uh, I'd ha I'd, I can't remember whether it was either a phone call or because I happened to... Uh, be at the offices um, for some reason. I, I mean, I didn't go to the offices very often at all. Uh, Martin Harvey said um, that there'd been uh, the Archer inquiry, and that as a as a result of that, the Caxton Foundation was being set up to help people who'd had contaminated blood that uh, had resulted in them having hepatitis C. Um, and then I remember a, a sort of briefing, if you like, from uh, Rosamond Riley, Ros Riley, um, who told me um, about their early experiences and understanding of, of registrants' needs. Um, I didn't really know what hepatitis C was, so I, I, um, I did a bit of research. Um, I looked on the Hepatitis C Trust website. I um, actually also asked um, a doctor friend of mine to explain it. Um, so I sort of tried to get up to speed with it. Um, from what I could gather, uh, the Caxton Foundation was a sort of mirror image of McFarland Trust in the terms that it would make um, payments to people. And have you been able to um, provide a full range of work for registrants for the McFarland Trust and the Caxton Foundation, including advocacy and representation at tribunal hearings? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, it's. I'd like to... Well, I can confidently say, actually, I'll provide a 360-degree service. Um, you know, it really isn't just a question of checking their benefits and telling them what they could claim. I mean, I... 
I will help them through the claims process, particularly for employment and support allowance and personal independence payment, where there are quite lengthy self-assessment reports to, uh, forms to complete. Um, I will also deal with problems arising out of that that could range from delays through to um, gathering further medical evidence or maybe even evidence from carers sometimes, um, uh, filtering out evidence that they may have put together that actually is not really very relevant or not very helpful um, in some way. Um, you know, sometimes people put in lots of evidence like copies of appointment letters which don't really help anyone. Um, uh, if, uh, if they then have to undergo an assessment, um, I, they will contact me and I will then brief them on what to expect and, um, you know, how to, you know, uh, get that across. Pointing out, to be honest, some of the trick questions that are asked during some of these assessments. Um, then uh, they would let me know what the result was when they got the decision through. If it was a, if it was a good decision, then obviously that's, that's the end of the case, unless there's any passported benefits that then need sorting out as a result of that. Um, because sometimes when people are rewarded for benefits such as personal independence payment, they may become entitled to higher rates of means-tested benefits, or a carer may qualify for, for, for carer's allowance. If they're turned down, then obviously you know, a lot of work then has to be done, an awful lot of work. Um, get hold of the assessment report, get, ask the client to go through it, um, identify obvious errors, factual errors, uh, things they, they didn't say or that were clearly wrong, um, send the report to me, I go through it, identify inconsistencies, check the registration of the health professional, um, put together uh, a challenge to that. I mean, since 2013, we've got a two-stage appeals process, which the government introduced. Um, so you draft up a mandatory reconsideration, which is the first stage. Um, it may also involve getting some medical evidence from their professionals um, or, or, or other, other sources. Um, then um, uh, submitting that mandatory reconsideration, possibly chasing it up. I'm sorry I'm going on, but I'm trying to give you a, a picture of just how complex this work is. Um, and if that is successful, then all well and good. If it's not, then the next stage starts, which is to um, draft up a notice of appeal to the first tier tribunal. Um, then you wait, you might have to chase the DWP, you might have to apply to the judge for directions to get the DWP to reduce their, their submission. Their submission comes back, usually around about 100 pages typically. Go through that, um, making notes, put together my own written submission in response to that, maybe some further medical evidence again. Send that off to the tribunal, to the, uh, the tribunal's office, um, and then uh, wait for a hearing date. Hopefully, on the back of all of that, the DWP would have revised their decision favourably. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Actually, increasingly, they do. Um, and if you then, you know, have a, have, it has to go to a hearing before the first tier tribunal, then obviously people are going to need representing. Most of the time, they're going to need representing. So so, and on it goes. You know, I've, I've had cases which, you know, where the first tier tribunal refused, you know, we, the, the appeal was dismissed, and so I've had to appeal, submit an appeal to the, uh, uh, well, sorry, I'll start again. They had to make an application for leave to appeal to the upper tribunal, and uh, some cases indeed have then gone to the tribunal, and then sometimes actually remitted back to the first tier tribunal. I'm sorry, that's a very long answer, but you know, I, I just think. You know, it'd be helpful to know. You know, and obviously, unless you're familiar with this area of practice. And so, presumably, if if you're not available to assist a registrant to go through all of those steps, that's something they'd have to do on their own. Sadly, yes, yeah, increasingly so, because there's been massive retrenchment in the funding for the advice sector since 2010. Um, I, one of the areas of work I've done over the years is to do reviews of advice services and audits of advice provision. 
And I, I'll never forget the Citizen Advice Bureau in North London, where they, they where queues start forming at half past six in the morning, and they open the doors at nine o'clock. They let in twenty people and they close the doors, and they deal with those twenty. That's all they can deal with, and that's that's actually, and that situation actually, if anything's got worse, I think. Shim can we have up WITN 347001? I just want to um, take you to a paragraph in your first witness statement. Uh, and you say this uh, about the um, McFarland Trust and, and the Caxton Foundation on page four, please. Paragraph 19. I was given complete freedom to represent clients and to be a vigorous advocate against the DWP and local authorities. Many charities, especially those with links to government, get anxious about not upsetting government departments. But it's a tribute to those charities that they always fully supported my work on behalf of beneficiaries. You can take that down there, Shemek. Um, so that was your experience, was it, in of both the McFarland Trust and, and the Caxton Foundation? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the reasons I, I continue to work for them. I mean, I have worked for, um, uh, you know, done work for various bit, various charities and so on. And sometimes people get very sort of nervous about someone being a vigorous advocate. Um, and, and I was surprised because, you know, I was aware that they were funded by the Department of Health. And, um, uh, you know, I'm aware sometimes that senior officials from one department, you know, might go and have a quiet word with one in another department saying, can you get this guy to turn down what he's doing? Um, and I am, you know, I'm aware that that's happened to advice workers. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, they've been told, they've had their wings clipped by the organisation they work for. Um, and, um, you know, particularly actually local authorities um, sort of getting upset at the vigour um, of, of certain welfare rights advisors when they've challenged their decisions. Um, so I always found them very supportive and they were well aware of what I was doing. You know, my, my monthly reports were saying, oh, we've submitted a second complaint and, you know, it will probably take three months. Here we go again. I'll put in another complaint because they haven't done it properly. I'm going to refer it to the person's member of parliament to get them to sort it out. Um, uh, I can remember... You know, going through a terrible stage in from about 2012 to about 2014-15, where, where you'd win a case uh, on employment support allowance, particularly, and uh, you'd win it at tribunal maybe, or get it, get the DWP to revise the decision after you've applied for a reconsideration. And then you'd find six months later they're forcing per per the person to undergo yet another assessment. So of course, you know, I mean, I'd get onto it straight away, and you know, and it, it smacks of disability discrimination actually that kind of behaviour. Um, and I've made very very strong representations, and the and the charities knew I was doing that, and they 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 supported me in it. Um, and the, and the meetings we had with the DWP. You know, they heard some of the strong words I had to say about the DWP's decision making on benefit entitlement and, and on dealing with um, people who had not declared their, um, their their charity monies. So I call it charity monies, just collectively. So. And we'll certainly come and look at some of the detail of both of those issues: uh, continual assessments and uh, declaration of charity monies a little bit later on. Um, you also tell us that you provided um, pro bono advice to two registrants of the Skipton Fund, but there was no um, opportunity for any um, for you to, to take that any further. Is that right? Because there was no no mechanism by which the Skipton Fund could pay for your services. Uh, no, that's not not quite right. I mean, the there were two cases. I, I tried to think. I think it was Nick Fish phoned me and said that these this was before Caxton was set up. That there were two people. There were. Uh, there, there were people who had some benefit issues, um, and um, he said there was nothing to, you know, there was no funds. I said, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll do it pro bono. 
and so I phoned them. I remember one of them, I had several conversations um, to, to point them in the right direction, but actually they were both cases where it wasn't necessary to do any ongoing casework anyway. I mean, if there was, I, I don't know, I may, I may have done it. Um, and then, um, turning then to uh, ask you some questions about the arrangements with the English infected uh, blood support scheme and indeed the Scottish infected blood support um, scheme. Um, the, can you explain the ar arrangements that you have with, um, with, with the English infected blood uh, support scheme? I understand you're not a contractor with them. You, do, you contract directly with the registrant, is that right? Yes, sorry. Can I refer to them as EVES, because yes. everyone does? Um, yeah, there was a very difficult period when, um, uh, in, in this sort of transition from the, the, the charities to EVES, and, and um, I was carrying, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was about 15 cases um, that were, um, you know, there, there were sort of casework cases involving um, tribunals and or mandatory reconsideration. And, uh, um, about a week before, um, I had a call from a uh, very helpful man called Mr. Chris Tempest in Eves and talked through um, what could happen. Um, he said that uh, they didn't want to undertake uh, a direct contract with me. And in fact, I wouldn't want a direct contract with, 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 with them because my concern would be it might affect my independence uh, as an advocate against the DWP. And um, uh, so he said that I needed to have a contract with people. They originally set up this, uh, they asked me to set up this process so that I would send the invoice for my work each month to the individual clients. And um, those people would then forward the invoice to Eves. But it, it just fell apart as soon as it happened because some people say they never received my invoices. Some some people sent the invoices to Ebes using a free post address that they provided, and it was never received. And in fact, a few months later, got returned um, uh, to them. And uh, some people paid me um, direct, and then sent the invoice on to Ebes. I mean, it was just a mess. And um, so I, I rang Chris Tempest and said, "Look, this is just not going to work." And so he said, let me go and have a word with my, with my um, colleagues in contracting and procurement. And it was then agreed that uh, what I would do would be, um, I would send the invoice direct to Eves, and it would be an invoice on behalf of the people I'd, I'd helped. Um, and that, that's worked pretty well. And you know, they pay very quickly. I, you know, it's a straightforward process now. Again, is there any limit on the assistance you can provide to registrants of EBS, EBS registrants? What do you mean limit? So will they pay for certain certain kinds of casework, but not, for example, advocacy at tribunals or, or the like? No, no, they've paid, they've paid for advocacy at tribunals as well. Uh, and you've described that the transfer to EBS um, not being straightforward. I think you say in your um, witness statement there were te teething problems. Did those problems adversely affect any of the cases on your in your caseload? Uh, no, I mean I just carried on working on them because that was the right thing to do um, but I did actually have to say to them look I can't carry on working on all these cases you know without being paid. Um, if it had been one or two it probably wouldn't have been a problem but um, you know it was, it was a lot and also people generally um, beneficiaries of the community needed to know um, that I was still available. Uh, you know, I was picking up the feedback that people still wanted to, to be able to use me. Um, so it didn't it didn't actually affect, if you like, the operation of the of the work. Um, it certainly, I know for some people it caused um, some anxiety because they didn't know whether I was going to be able to continue on their case. Um, um, I suppose it's inevitable, really, when you get 
you know, set up a new organisation, so it's never going to be entirely smooth. So, as far as you're aware, again, to EBS, if somebody wants to use your services, there's a registrant at EBS and that they can. There's no cap on how many people you can help or the kinds of people you can help. Uh, no, if they're registered, if they're registered with EBS, that's it. Um, the only cap, to be honest, is is uh, is my workload. Um, but I've not yet had to say no. The inquiries. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the, just to say, I mean, I've had a couple of people, and it is literally what two, maybe two or three, or one or two, really, really small numbers, where people have asked me, uh, "Can you help me um, sort out um, appealing against the decision by EBS that I don't qualify for?" payment um, and um, you know it's not really what I do I, it's not my area of expertise so I'm, so I'm very sorry I don't um, but you know I've said to them you know do use the appeals procedure um, I had one gentleman who was struggling with a um, stage two payment application um, because he had mental health issues and his first language wasn't English and he had no one else to help him complete the paperwork actually he, he was on his own and very isolated where he lived so I um, that's actually had quite a lot of hot community hostility so I, I completed that uh, paperwork for him and, uh, and liaised with his with his haemophilia nurse The inquiries received evidence to suggest that at least one Eves registrant has asked Eves to pay um, your bills that, that, that she's incurred um, instructing you um, to help with benefits issues and Eves have refused to pay the bill. Do you know how that could have arisen? Well, I don't really know, know the criteria other than am I right in thinking that, that there's a gap in the provision for um, uh, I was going to say uh, children, I mean, they're not children, they're adults now, but offspring of people who are infected. I mean, I don't know the rules and the criteria uh, that they operate. Um, I, I am aware of that situation. It did happen in another case. Um, circumstances were, were different, actually. Um, and I thought, this is just so unjust to do this to people. So I stuck my neck out and made very strong representations to Eves. Um, they really were quite strong. Um, and, and they did actually then agree to pay in that, that case as a one-off. Um, I, mean, I don't want to be critical of them, but you know I do think that's a deficiency, it's a gap. And there's not that many people who, who would be affected, actually. But as far as you're aware, if somebody is a registrant of EBS uh, and you are able to take on their case, um, EBS will pay for, for you to assist them with benefits work. Yeah, that's my understanding, yeah. yeah. Can I just say EBS also do say to people, or quite often, I understand anyway, that people will contact EBS and say, oh, I've got this problem with my benefits. And, and I've certainly had cases where um, EBS have uh, recommended people contact me for help. I did have one person who said the inquiry had recommended me. I don't know if that's true. Do, do you know what the criteria EBS use for um, uh, advising people to contact you? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's simply that someone needs benefits advice, welfare rights advice. And do you know what um, information EBS registrants are given about your services? H how they would know that you exist and could help them? Um, I have asked them to put some information on their website because it, it has that kind of sort of generic um, comment that people could go to their civil advice bureau and as I explained, that's not really a very practical uh, all the time. Um, uh, I think there is some information that's gone out. Um, I've um, had contact with the Tainted Blood campaign, who I get on well with, and um, 
uh, I picked up very early on that some people thought that I was no longer providing service. Um, and, you know, I'd have people contact me and they said, oh, I didn't know that you, we could still get your help. Um, so I, I actually, through Tainted Blood, I sent out a message saying, look, I, I still exist and I'm, I'm able to um, help. Um, and, uh, and there's been a couple of occasions I've put out similar messages. Uh, um, no, I don't know the detail of what they do. They also meant, I think I noticed they mentioned it in their annual report. Um, we, we looked at the feedback form that you give, you gave to the Caxton and, uh, and McFarland Trust. What sort of feedback do you give to IBS? That's the same. That sort of stuff. Um, and is it right, I think it's right from what you said, that you don't at, at the moment provide any advice to any registrants of either the Welsh Infected Blood Support Scheme or the infect a registrant of the Infected Blood Payment Scheme for Northern Ireland? Uh, no. Um, I understand that in Wales the, there is some arrangement with uh, some advice workers employed by the Valindra um, NHS Trust. And Northern Ireland, I don't know what happens. Uh, Northern Ireland, some of the some of the benefit rules are slightly different as well. Scotland, it's they've just. Uh, I was told um, I had a call in August from an official there who said that uh, um, they'd done a survey and um, people had said they need access to benefits advice and specifically mentioned me. Um, so they asked me to. I said, would I be willing to take? Um, Referrals, so um, I've, I've said yes. As I say, it's it's quite recent. I've, I've only um, had three from them. And the arrangements there. What are the arrangements there? Do you contract in, in, in with individual registrants, or are you? Is no, it all they, coming? They, it's slightly different. I they they they, um, they asked me to. I mean, they sent to me a referral um, with some basic details. Very very basic. Again, very very basic details. Um, and then they just say, just send us the invoice at the, when you finish the work. Um, uh, and you mentioned... The cases I've had have not been very time-consuming so far, actually. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Haemophilia Society had started recommending you to their uh, members for benefits work. Do you have any uh, kind of arrangement with them that the Haemophilia Society will pay fees if you undertake work for their members? Um, no, no. Um, well, there was one case. It was a very unusual case. It's, it was not an infected blood case. Uh, it was not someone who who, who had been infected. It's it extremely complex. It's probably the most complex case I have ever ever dealt with, um, uh, involving. Um, I don't sort of say too much about it, really, but. Um, the, the DWP's tribunal submission was nearly a foot high, um, and they did contribute towards um, paying for that. And in fact, actually, I've done a load of pro bono work on that case as well. It's it's ongoing. Can I, um, sh 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 Shomit, Can you um, uh, turn up W I T N three four eight seven zero zero six? I'm going to ask you some questions about the consent process that you go through with your clients on sharing personal data. So this is a form that you provided to the inquiry um, with your witness statement. Um, uh, this is uh, the consent form, is it, from the Caxton Foundation, uh, which requires a registrants to consent to two things at the um, bottom half of that page. I hereby confirm that I would like a referral to the benefits advisor. I consent to details about me and my fa and any family member being passed to the advisor by the Caxton Foundation and the Skipton Fund, if, appro if applicable or necessary. And I consent to the advisor providing a report to the Caxton Foundation regarding the advice given to me and recommendations made. 
and then it says, please note, we will refer you to the benefits advisor without you giving us consent to receive a report and recommendations from them. However, without this information, it may be more difficult for us to assess the best way we can help you. So is this form something you would have received in respect of every client that you helped at the Caxton Foundation? Uh, the vast majority. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think when this came in. Uh, maybe it was 2012, 2013. Um, I mean, I'd always understood that people had given verbal consent um, to, you know, for me to communicate with, with the charity. Um, I think it's also inherent in the fact that you've got um, uh, people who are engaged with the charity on a long-term basis, on an ongoing basis. Um, the information flows back and forth. And then, obviously, as a professional who's sort of working with the organisation, uh, albeit I'm independent, um, the, um, it's sort of inherent that there will have to be that sort of exchange of information. Um, I will, I did, so that final paragraph, I really can't remember anyone coming to me who didn't give their consent. I wouldn't have done the, you know, I just wouldn't have done the work on the case. Or maybe there was wine or something, in which case I didn't do a report. But I remember when that was drafted, sort of feeling a bit uncomfortable about that paragraph. But, but having said that, you know, I know that grant-making charities have those kind of restrictions and conditions, and a lot of them require people to maximise their benefits before they'll give a grant. Um, or, or a lot of them, especially the smaller ones, um, require people to apply through a third party professional, be it a GP, social worker, or, or whoever. Uh, and you said, you, you just said that you, were, you felt uncomfortable about a, a paragraph. Was that the paragraph in brackets you felt uncomfortable about? Yeah, uh, I, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, and I may be wrong, um, I think I asked them to take it out or something. Um, but uh, but then I could also see their point of view that, you know, um, knowing that someone's benefits had been maximised um, was useful information for them because um, it revealed people's poverty. Um, and the other things, there were people contacting who, who both charity, well, actually particularly Caxton, who said, I've got no money to live on. Um, can you can you help me out? You know that type of, of request, and quite rightly they were they were referring people to me. Um, you know because a lot of the time, most of the time, um, I was able to sort out some benefits for them. And uh, I mean they're still not going to be well off, but um, it you know, keeps the wolf from the door a bit. This isn't. Um really a, a question about about you and your services, but more about the way in which uh, the Caxton Foundation was uh, referring people or, or communicating with its own registrants. Um, uh, the objection that I can see to the first paragraph and the piece in brackets uh, is that it seems pretty pointless to say to someone, can you please consent? But by the way, doesn't matter if you do or not. Um, we're going to do it. And the second uh, observation, and by all means make a comment, uh, is that it refers to consenting, uh, somebody consenting to details about me, well that's fine, and any family members who one might have thought uh, had the right to consent themselves to their information being, being passed on. But um, these are not matters really for, for you to comment on unless you want to do so. It's more a matter of uh, the relationship between the Caxton Foundation in this respect uh, and the individual. Yeah, I think the issue with family members is so often, because particularly so many people um, are having to claim means-tested benefits, people's um, partners and dependent children are aggregated into the, the benefit assessment. So you, you end up having to ask about partners' earnings and, and uh, 
sadly, actually, even you have to sometimes even ask, you know, if, if, a, if a youngster's got capital in their own right, and it occasionally crops up. Not, not with this group, though. Um, but that's, that's the benefit system. That's not me being intrusive. Um, I, I, and, I didn't suggest uh, it's you at all. Sorry? I didn't suggest it's, it's, it's down to you at all. This is really yeah. a, more an observation on the content of the form. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a reasonable observation, Sir Brian. I mean, one thing I, I would say, I think given um, great, much greater public awareness of, of privacy and data protection issues, which has developed over the years, um, you know, it's easy to look back at arrangements that, that happened even maybe 10, 15 years ago and say, oh, that's not very good. Um, whereas now... Um, you know, if you, if you look at a website, you have to agree to, you know, them to have cookies or whatever it is on your on your computer, and you know, the whole thing of privacy and consent um, is much much tighter these days than it was was back in the day. So, if you have a client that had filled out one of these forms, for example, the the second tick box, I consent to the advisor providing a report to Caxton clearly gives you explicit consent to share information with the Caxton Foundation. Do I understand from your previous answer that in cases where there wasn't one of these forms, either because it was a client that you had before this form was generated or for some other reason, you didn't seek explicit consent to provide information to Caxton uh, following the conclusion of your uh, work? Well, no, I say my understanding was that verbal consent had been given for, for me to do that been given to you or to Caxton? Sorry, to the, the, the client had given verbal consent to Caxton for me to communicate with them about that. Uh, and did the McFarlane Trust have a similar form to this, do you recall? It was identical. As I recall, it was the same. And do you recall whether it came in at the same time? Uh, I think so, yeah. And so presumably your, your answer about the, the assuming that there'd been verbal consent between the benefit, the, the registrant and McFar um, uh, McFar the Caxton Fund also applies equally to McFarlane. Yeah. yeah, I'm using it sort of interchangeably, really. And then just dealing with the position with it, Ebes, um, can we have, please, um, Shomik, uh, NBAT 5016... Now, again, this is a document that you've provided to the inquiry. Yeah. Is this your form that you've generated for your clients? Yeah, this is um, this is the current iteration of the consent form. It's um, much more specific, I accept. Um, in the light of experience, um, and also following um, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, um, which was what I think three, four years ago. I think it came into force. Um, uh, I may be wrong on the date. Um, I think p all organisations have reviewed their data protection and, and privacy arrangements. Um, the other thing that the other thing that made me um, change this form and and so on. Um, at a final, uh, where are we? The, f the final sentence, information will only be disclosed without my consent when it involves a risk to myself or the health or safety of a third party. I think that's always been sort of implicit in what we do. I mean, for example, I, as I understand it, the professional conduct rules for solicitors state that, um, you know, if, if a client reveals information that places the third party at risk, then the normal confidentiality rules don't apply and the solicitor can pass that information on. And I, I have had I had one case in particular, it was child protection issues that arose, where the um, the client disclosed to me that he he had um, he had administered um, an illegal substance uh, to his children in order to, quote, calm them down, unquote. 
Um, as an ex-social worker myself and having done child protection work in the past, that obviously rang fairly major alarm bells. Um, and I did speak to the social worker who was it, but there was, there was already child protection involvement. Um, children were subsequently removed from the family and, uh, and um, placed elsewhere. So, so this form, I give consent for Neil Bateman and Neil Bateman and Company to disclose any personal data or personal information about me to the NHS BSA and um, uh, they hold o on me or about me to, and, and equally the other way they can disclose <coughs> data to you. Um, would you, for the, for the three clients you have um, from, that are registrants of SIBS, would you have had a similar form? I've asked them to pull one together. Um, they've operated on the basis of verbal consent, um, but I have actually asked them. They said they're going to. Shemek, you can take that down. Thank you. Um, what proportion of your work is concerned with those infected and, and affected by contaminated blood? Um, well, the. the at the moment, it's uh, <laughs> it's strange times, isn't it? Um, so I wouldn't want to draw any conclusions from what happens at the moment. Um, I did measure it back in 2017. Um, and the work's just built up and built up because of welfare reform and very bad benefit decisions. Uh, so it was about two thirds then. And do you know whether um, McFarlane Trust and Caxton uh, Foundation employees, when they were, uh, when those charities were operating, uh, and it, it, Eve's staff now, um, were, are expected to provide some advice on benefits to their registrants? Uh, I'm not aware. You'll have to ask them. Um, uh, I know that they do give. Hang on, I do. I know that they do give um, general advice in uh, that's reflected on the, in the document. For example, it's on the Eves website about the way that uh, payments from Eves are treated for social security purposes. Um, but um, uh, I, I don't know. You'd have to have to ask. Ask other people. And you haven't been asked to provide any training to staff in order to allow them to div deliver advice on benefits from any of those organisations? Um, not, not, not at Eves, no. Um, I was asked to do some training for Caxton and McFarlane staff um, uh, uh, by Martin Harvey, but um, and then Martin was off sick and, and left, and it, it never happened. Um, what I would say, though, is that, um, you know, obviously I've written quite a lot of information that's gone out to beneficiaries in one, one form or another um, and has been on their websites and so on. Um, and I've had sort of general conversations. Occasionally, actually, I'd get a call from R Ros Riley who would say, Neil, this doesn't sound right that someone's had X, Y and Z happen to them. And so you have a conversation, explain it. And obviously that's a learning exercise for for that person, for, for Ros. Um, I wouldn't expect them necessarily to give benefits advice. Uh, I have to say that the benefit system has become increasingly dysfunctional and increasingly complex. When I started doing this work um, back as a, as a law student in, in the 1970s, the handbooks I had um, were two little handbooks that were about, about that that thick. Now, the books I have to use take up nearly two foot um, shelf space. Is this right, that you um, were not involved in, in the main, in, in formulating policies for either McFarlane Trust or the Caxton Foundation? Um, there's one, one instance where you asked to advise on a policy and I'll come back to that in due course but in the main you weren't well you weren't involved in formulating policies 
although you might have been no. asked to, 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 to give some advice in respect of policies. Is that right? Yeah, that's basically it, as I've set out in my witness statement. Uh, and, uh, and is that the same for, for um, Eves and Sibs? Uh, I've had no involvement whatsoever in the Sibs. Uh, I mean, I, hope, I, hope, I don't even know how they, what their policies are. Eves, um, I noticed on their website there was a form for applying for discretionary payment. And um, it had such horrendous mistakes on it. I mean, it was asking for details of benefits that don't even exist, I remember. Um, and um, so I did... Um, what did I do? I think I rang Chris Tempest and said, look, you really need to amend this. Um, and I emailed, if I remember correctly, I emailed him with um, suggested changes. Uh, and then they did correct that correct that but I've had no involvement policy wise um, I've had discussions with a couple of the managers there um, about what can we do about this vexatious issue of people being asked to attend compliance interviews or fraud uh, interviews under caution about undeclared um, benefits I think we've we've got some some improvements done in the sense that they will they will turn out a um, standard letter to help people um, but uh, other than that I don't think that I have any policy uh, discussions um. and to be I, I, I am going to come on and ask you about about that issue um, is it also right that you um, were not involved in making decisions about the support that, that, that could or should be given by those organisations, by the McFarland Trust, by the Caxton Foundation, and now by Eves and Sibs, to their registrants? Uh, no, I'm just not interested at all and didn't want to do it. Uh, I, as I've said in my witness statement, the charities have their place. Um, and they perform a valuable function in terms of filling gaps in state provision. Um, but uh, having sat on um, various committees in, in a previous life um, dealing with applications for discretionary help, I feel very, very uncomfortable. I don't enjoy it at all. It's not really what I want to do. I'd much rather be fighting for people's rights. Uh, and is this also right, that the only circumstances in which you have ever made a recommendation that support should be provided to a client um, from one of those organisations is when their benefits have been stopped and you have been working to reinstate those benefits so you've made a recommendation to the relevant charitable body, McFarland Trust Caxton, that they should effectively <coughs> plug the gap, um, make the payments while that um, challenge is, 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 is ongoing. As I recall, they were all Caxton cases, um, and obviously one of the things you ask people when their benefits are stopped is, you know, are you going to manage okay? Um, and if they say no, then I'll say, well, I'll, I'll contact uh, Caxton, and, um, and Caxton actually were very good at that. They would get a decision turned around pretty much immediately, uh, and also payment out to people if they needed it. Um, the, um, there were a couple of cases where there were quite, you know, people were in real difficulty. I mean, there was one that, you know, I'll never forget this woman, she was a widow, um, who was just drowning in debt and, uh, couldn't afford the rent and, you know, all sorts of difficulty with her, her children and stuff. And I did, you know, uh, they asked me to do a sort of more extensive report, which was about a page. I'm setting that out. And, um, but I mean, I studiously, studiously clear, sorry, <laughs> rephrase that. Um, I studiously kept clear of getting involved in the sort of decision making on, on discretionary payments. So you haven't ever assisted a client in challenging a decision made by the McFarland Trust, the Caxton Foundation, or now Eves? 
No, because as I said earlier, it's not really my area of expertise. I think the other thing is, um, it's not so much with Eves, um, because I'm more distant from them, um, but with with Caxton and McFarlane, I think potentially it could have created um, problems in the working relationship. And, you know, it's really important to try to maintain a good working relationship in order to help the, the, my clients. So then, having established the things you don't do, if we can run down the things that you, you do, uh, the services you do provide, um, is this right? You've provided advice on benefits and changes to the benefit systems to the organisations as a whole, to McFarlane Trust and Caxton Foundation. Uh, yes, attended um, some meetings. Um, I would also actually, I, met, I can remember phoning uh, Jan Barlow and Martin and saying, look, I'm really concerned about what's happening with this trend of cases. It's indicative of a, a deeper problem. Um, I mean, particularly with Jan, I remember saying, look, we're getting all these ridiculous decisions, refusing people employment support allowance. We, you know, we need to approach the DWP to try to change that. Um, I would uh, I would write little sort of if you like newsletters and stuff, um, which went out to people. Um, I remember going to a meeting of um, registrants in Reading in a hotel, um, sort of chain hotel, um, and spending I don't know two hours or whatever. Um, Briefing them, almost doing a mini training session on on uh, on the benefit changes and answering their sort of questions and, and having discussions with them. Um, Did you do you recall going yeah. do, having any uh, attending any of uh, any similar meetings for the Caxton Foundation or for any of the other Alliance House organisations? I've never had any involvement with um, with the Eileen Trust. I didn't really know very much about them. Um, other than Martin Harvey had told me the group they supported and that they were very small. Um, the, um, the, uh, I don't recall going to any um, meetings with them. Um, I used to um, send out occasionally from time to time bits of information, particularly through tainted blood, because I knew that could get to people. Uh, and has anyone, did, 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 has the McFarlane Trust or any other uh, of the Alliance House, House organisations, Alliance House organisations, ever asked you to provide a note setting out the statutory framework for the benefits disregard? I certainly would have um, mentioned it to them, and it certainly came up at meetings with the DWP. Um, and I mean it's just taken as read that the payments are disregarded so you don't nest in a conversation with McFarlane Trust I have a feeling I did draft something um, something. I remember actually one case where DWP fraud investigators had obviously picked up that someone was getting payments from uh, Capstan or, or McFarlane um, or when FET and um, they'd written um, actually no two cases that's right and they'd, ri they'd written quite sort of assertive letters to the charities demanding details of the payments um, the one was a local authority fraud investigator the other was DWP so I, I can remember drafting um, a, a fairly strong but polite response for them to send um, saying we're not going to tell you because we don't have to tell you and anyway they're fully disregarded under this under the regulation the particular regulation and that was the end of those two cases um, and then you have mentioned that the is it right to sort of rather crudely divide the the sorts of of work you do in, into two two different cohorts one is is benefits check which is effectively checking that the registrant is getting all the benefits that they should be getting 
uh, and the second is, is, is all the other work is dealing with, with, with a, any particular problem that the, bene that the, the registrant has with their benefits uh, in whatever the many different um, uh, guises that, that those problems can, can arise. Yeah, so it could be, a, yeah, that's broadly so. I mean, you do a benefits check, which is a sort of assessment of their benefits entitlement, anything that they're perhaps not claiming. That may or may not reveal um, w w areas which need further work. In addition, I mean, like, for example, the consent form you put up from the, from the, the registrant, um, you know, that's very clear. That's casework from the off. Um, his ESA had been stopped. And um, uh, lastly, on, on sort of general points, um, y is this right that you, the way that you work with people is is through phone and presumably email contact rather than face to face? Yeah. Um, uh, having um, managed advice services, having carried out lots of reviews and audits of advice work, including um, work done by solicitors firms, um, home visits um, are very nice, but they're immensely time consuming. Um, and particularly bearing in mind that people are sort of scattered to the four corners of the United Kingdom. Um, you know, it can take you all day or two days to do maybe one visit. Um, so I, I work by telephone. Um, because of the pandemic, we'll be doing stuff like this on Zoom. But um, uh, it's, it's worked very effectively. And I know lots of specialist level advisors who do work like that. It's, I'm, not, I'm not unusual in any way. Um, Obviously, I do a tribunal. I would to meet the client, and I'd meet them before the hearing as well. So I, I note the time. We've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. I don't know if now is a, an appropriate time for a break. Uh, yes. Um, how much longer do you think you're going to be? Well, I think I'm probably... I've, I've got probably more than an hour of questions left, I would say. Right. So... It, Okay, well, let's, uh, let's take a break now until 4 o'clock uh, and uh, allow people to have a, uh, an afternoon cup of tea if that's what they would like to do. Thank you. So, uh, 4 o'clock. Um, now, you're giving evidence. You must not talk to anyone uh, about the evidence you have given or anything that you think you might yet be asked to uh, explore in evidence. Uh, 4 o'clock. Yes, thank you.